Laura at the JW Marriott Hotel, speaking with well-known author Jake Needham. Jake, thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here and happy to be at the, uh, the Marriott, as we were talking about before. This is a happy place for me because I wrote the last two-thirds of the King of Macau here. They were uh, doing demolition on a building next to our apartment, and the noise was just wretched. So an old pal of mine, who's the GM here, rescued me and set me up here in the executive lounge. and. Uh, I rode for a couple of weeks and they brought me cups of coffee and cookies and it's uh, it's a good place to come back to. It's a happy place for me. I rode well here. Good. Um, we've obviously spoken before, but for perhaps some of our viewers who are not familiar with your work, if you can just tell us a little bit more about your background, how you came to be in Bangkok, and how indeed you turned into a novelist. Well, as they always say, it's a long story. They always say that. They, they? they always do, and it normally is. Well, let me see if I can make it a little bit shorter. Um, I was writing um, screenplays um, uh, back uh, in the, uh, the 80s uh, and early 90s. Uh, prior to that, I practiced law in Washington, and we won't even start with how I got from that to writing screenplays, because that is a, a long story. But uh, HBO bought a screenplay of mine um, called Natural Causes, which was uh, set in Southeast Asia. And after they set it up for production here, I think they suddenly realized they had nobody on the crew who had any idea where Thailand was. And on the suspicion that it might be a good idea to have somebody on the deal who could figure out where it was, they hired me as uh, one of the line producers. And uh, I was out here uh, involved in the production. And at, uh, at the time, the, uh, the woman uh, who I am now married to was the editor of Tatler magazine here in Thailand and came out of the set one day to interview me and, uh, and like that. And a couple of years later, we had a son and uh, we've had an apartment here ever since and have lived in Thailand most of the time, although now that our sons uh, are up and grown and away, we spend a lot more time in the U.S. than we do here. Uh, I wrote my first novel really as a kind of a gag. I was just trying to figure out if I could uh, write books instead of screenplays because trying to deal with the movie industry in Los Angeles from, from Bangkok was really a pain in the ass and I was just tired of it. And I sat down and uh, wrote what I thought was a kind of send-up of the, uh, the standard Bangkok bar girl books that everybody was so enamored of. Uh, it was a thing called The Big Mango and as I said, it was meant to be a bit of a joke. Uh, but it ended up being published and nobody got the joke. Everybody thought it was another one of those books. Uh, but happily, one that was maybe a little better written than the, the rest and a bit more interesting, and so it sold like crazy. And I suddenly discovered that I was responsible for turning out books and uh, started taking it seriously and have written seven cents. And um, so I guess it's worked out okay. So you mentioned that you, your latest book, The King of Macau, you actually wrote the last bit of it, Where We Are Right Now. Um, that's part of the Jack Shepard um, series. Can you tell us a little bit more about the series and about the character itself? Yeah, the, the idea of the Shepard series really was, as an expat living in Asia, I thought it was odd that there were really no books out there about expats, American expats. I, th I think Americans don't really understand the expat experience, that uh, Brits and Europeans are much better at that. Uh, expatriates are a normal part of your life. But I think most Americans don't even know what the word means, that we think it is spelled X hyphen patriot, as in somebody who was once a patriot but is no longer. Um, Americans don't cope with the idea of, of, of Americans going and living somewhere else, that, that our whole basis of life is that immigration is a one-way street. Everybody wants to come to America. So I think it would be kind of fun to write about an American who ended up living in, in Asia largely on a whim, which is how I think most of us got here. Uh, and the origin of the Shepard novels was Shepard was a lawyer uh, in finance and banking mostly in the U.S. who was a well-known expert in money laundering. And an old pal of his that he was working on a case with was appointed dean of the Sassen School of Business at uh, Chulon and Corn University. And Shepard was having dinner with him in Singapore one night on some business matter, and the guy offered him a job teaching at Sasson. And Shepard thought about it a second and said, yeah, yeah, why not? Which is how most of us ended up here, sort of, hey, why not? And uh, um, so I thought that was kind of fun to see how it would all develop. And, and what's been fun for me about the series is up to four books now. And so as with all of us, over a period of the sort of six or eight years of the books, Shepard is six or eight years different, and his experiences have added up, and 
his life has changed and uh, he's not the person who he was in the first book. Um, and he's probably not always going to be the person he is in the fourth book either. But by the time we get to the King of Macau, Shepard has been fired by Sassen by bringing them unhappy publicity, which they wanted no part of. And so he's living in a borrowed apartment in Hong Kong with uh, a few clients who think well of him and his knowledge of money laundering and foreign banking. And he's hired by MGM to investigate uh, money laundering uh, through the MGM Macau and wants no part of it at first because he assumes it must be the triads. And uh, even Shepard's not crazy enough to live in Hong Kong and investigate the triads. But when it turns out that it's probably not the triads, he gets involved anyway, and he gets involved with Stanley Ho and Pansy Ho and some of the other famous characters of Macau, and, uh, and that's the book, and it was fun to write. Um, so, listening to you talk about money laundering and things like that, where do you get the inspiration? Where did you, how did you do your research for your books? I, th I think living in Asia is a, is a constant inspiration, that I, in the sense that all of my books spring from something that is true. Um, it's just part of life here. Um, the, the original idea for the Big Mango came from the collapse of Saigon and the idea that large amounts of money were presumably shipped out of Saigon uh, by the banks. Uh, the gold reserves were shipped out from the Bank of Vietnam and, and yet a lot of that was unaccounted for. So what happened? You got billions of dollars floating around out there in currency somewhere? Is it possible that some of that stuck to somebody's hands and ended up in strange places? And to me that's how you make a novel is you, uh, you take real events and you think about them a little bit and you say, well, what, what would have happened if, and you play it out a slightly different way. The oddity of that is that so much strange stuff happens in Asia that you find yourself in the position of writing about things that people think are true. I, I cannot tell you the number of times people have come up to me and said, oh, you know, that character in, and they name a certain character in a certain book, boy, you really describe him perfectly. And I said, no, no, you know, it's, oh, yeah, I get it, wink, wink, <laughs> made it up, right, wink, wink. And I know who they're talking about, but they're convinced that I know somebody they know and that I put them in the book. Um, in, in, uh, in a world of trouble, which was basically uh, written about Shepard being sucked up in, in the political turmoil in, in Thailand, um, I even had to put a note in the front of the book to remind people that I make this stuff up, that this isn't some sort of Ramana Clef or, or hidden political commentary on Thailand. It's made up, folks. And if some of it accidentally turns out to be true, it doesn't mean that, uh, that I was a prophet predicting the future. It only meant that something turned out to be true. And uh, I, I told a little story in, in the beginning of that book about a, a guy I've known for years who, who was in British intelligence and is retired now, living in Macau. And we were smoking good cigars one night and talking about one of my books, and he demanded to know how I'd found out about an operation, which I described in the books. And I kept telling him, I didn't find out about it, I made it up. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I finally convinced him I really did make it up. And he just sort of shook his head and he said, you know, that's the thing about living in Asia. You can't make anything up. Because whatever you make up, one of these days somebody's going to come up to you and either say, you know that really happened, or you know that's about to happen. And having just written a book about Thailand on the verge of a civil war, it was not happy to think that this time he might be right. And I said, I hope this time he was wrong. So tell us, a little bit more, was right. tell us a little bit more then about A World of Trouble, because you raised that at quite a, I think, uh, meaningful time with given what's happened in Bangkok at the moment. Well, it, it was originally set out, I, I think the best books are about small scale dramas set against large scale backgrounds. And, and the idea originally was that here Shepard is, and he's representing. Uh, He's a, he's a lawyer and looking after financial matters for a wealthy Thai who used to be prime minister and is now living in exile in Dubai. And of course, that's a familiar story. We've all heard that one. But it's not the same guy. It's a different guy. Because Charlie Kittnerock, who is the client and the former prime minister, uh, was in fact put in power by the army. And it is the army who wants to put him back in power, which of course, as you and I understand, is the opposite of the way things are here. But we had the red shirts and the yellow shirts and a sort of people's, people's power revolution who uh, put into power a woman prime minister. And at the time that I published the book years ago, 
people said, oh, that's silly. Nobody's ever going to believe that. You know, you need to change that part. But the, the whole point was to set Shepard up as the man in the middle, that he's a lawyer for Charlie Kipperock, who was trying to come back into power, and he's a friend, um, almost lover, but not quite, of, of this woman who ends up as prime minister. So Jack Shepard finds himself the, the ultimate man in the middle, and why he has no interest in trying to solve Thailand's problems, it becomes apparent that he may be the only person who can. And that's the making of the book. Uh, but it uh, involves clashes between the red shirts and the yellow shirts, and there was a sort of sense of inevitability about it, uh, which is really where it came from. So you mentioned earlier that you split your time between Thailand and um, the US. Obviously, you're here with us at the moment, um, and we've got the current protests going on and the whole Bangkok shutdown. Um, what, what's your take of what's happening here? How is it affecting you, if at all? Well, personally, I don't think it affects me at all. It's, one always is concerned about one's family, and because of my wife, we have family members here, and it affects them to some degree. But it's, you know, there's an inevitability about what you see developing in Thailand. If, if you were teaching a, a university-level course in social organization, you would be hard-pressed to find a better example of the collapse of the old order. Uh, it, it's almost the sort of French Revolution in reverse. Uh, in which the dying old order is struggling very hard against the inevitability of future change. And the sad part to me is that I think most of these people realize it, and, and that the goal is not to prevent something from happening, but to hang on as long as possible, and to delay the change as long as possible. But the change is going to come. I mean, look at examples of societies all around the world. Uh, you know, look anywhere you like. This has happened over and over. We've seen the end of this movie. We know how this ends. And, and for Thailand's sake, it needs to end as rapidly as possible. But circumstances make it hard to believe that it will end rapidly, that it is going to be drawn out because the courts have their own point of view and uh, the military has its point of view and everybody is in it for himself. And sadly enough, it seems to me that very few people are really looking to the future of, of the country. And there are a lot of people who are willing to damage the country as badly as they possibly can, if that's what it takes to sustain their position here. Hope it doesn't happen. Hope it's over soon. Don't think it will be. So turning back to books then, you mentioned that this is now your seventh book. Has the industry changed at all since um, the first book that you wrote? For example, um, Kindles and e-books are now very popular. Oh my, yes. And, and, and you know, from my point of view, that's been a wondrous thing because the, the difficulty with the book business has always been physical distribution. I mean, if you think about it a bit, the idea of this, this stack of papers bound between boards, that, that's got to be packed into boxes and boxes shipped to bookstores. And if you go into a bookstore and, and ask for my book and they don't have it, then the bookstore right down the street may have it, but you don't go there. So it, it becomes a near impossibility for any writer to, to get your books into general circulation unless the publisher is simply going to do a Da Vinci code on you and ship out a million copies so that there are 50 copies in front of every store in the world that, that sells books, and, and that doesn't happen, not unless you're the Da Vinci code. So from the standpoint of, of, of someone like me, who is, who is well known but not monstrously well known, the availability of e-books is just wondrous. Because now anybody recommends one of your books and someone wants to get it, they can get it instantly, get it in a few seconds, no matter where they are in the world. And, and when I look at my sales reports, I, I just think it's extraordinary. When you, you see sales in the Ukraine, and the two guys in Iceland wrote me recently about how they were going to start a fan club in Iceland. This is just crazy. And if you relied on printed books, there's, that there's no way that would happen. No. And, 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 and the, the other thing that happens is really nice is because of that, you develop a direct relationship with the people who read you. Anyone who wants to reach you on the internet can. Anyone who wants to send you a tweet. Boy, that book sucked. I don't want to read that again. There it is. Happily, that doesn't happen very often. People actually are terribly nice. And, and I hear from hundreds of people every week, and they say really nice things, and they don't want anything in return. They just they want to know you're there. That you know they read the book, and you know they liked it. And all they really want you to say is, that's great, thanks. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great situation for a writer where before we were sort of stuffed between 
retailers and publishers and all sorts of people who were standing between us and our ultimate audience and telling the audience what they could have and when they could get it. And, and now it's all gone. The, the shelf space electronically is infinite. Every book is available all of the time, 24 hours a day in the tiniest corner of the world. And particularly for someone whose, whose market is worldwide as mine is, it's not, it's not deep in any particular place, but it's spread all over the world. It's just a godsend. Uh, it's probably increased my sales tenfold in a couple of years. So it's interesting to hear that you've now got your own little fan club in Iceland. <laughs> what is it, do you think, about Bangkok and Thailand that makes for such an interesting setting for a book? Well, I, I, I think it's, it, you know, I think all of Asia is interesting in, in the sense that this is largely unplowed ground. Uh, when the gatekeepers in, in New York are in charge, they tell everybody that, uh, that Scandinavia is, no pun intended, cool. And, and so suddenly there are 10,000 books set in Scandinavia. But the general view of publishers worldwide is that Westerners don't give a damn about Asia and aren't interested in it, which is why you can go into your friendly Barnes & Noble or Waterstones or anywhere and look up at that big wall of new books and you won't see any set in Asia. They're just not there. Because publishers say people aren't interested. And that's why they don't publish them. Well, you know, I sell four or five thousand books a month for those people who aren't interested and, and that's fine with me and uh, I don't have to deal with those people anymore who get telling me that nobody's interested. Because I, I think the sort of stories that Asia throws up are just endlessly fascinating and, and not just to people who live here or who have visited here. The vast majority of people who buy my books have never been here, probably don't have any interest in coming here. But it's a fresh setting. It's something new. Uh, and I think that interests people, and, and that's one thing that keeps people coming back to my books, at least, and, and the other few books that are set here that are available worldwide, and they're really not that many. So you say, obviously, there's people who live here who read your books, but equally people who've never been here who read your books. Um, we've noticed over the last couple of years there seems to be an increasing amount of expats coming to Bangkok and settling here. Is this something you've noticed, and if so, do you have any views why that might be? Well, I think the place has changed a lot. When, when I first became involved with, with Thailand in the early 90s, when I was doing films, it was really a long way from anywhere. It was, uh, it was a sort of third level destination, not necessarily for tourists, but for commerce. Um, if you were a player in a law firm in New York or London, and you were interested in international assignment at all, which was not probable, but some people were. Europe was where everyone went. That was it. The people who ended up going to Asia were sort of half a cut below. Tokyo was an area in and of itself. Japan had, was on a different planet. So being in Japan didn't tie you to China. It didn't tie you to Southeast Asia. And places like Taiwan and Bangkok and Jakarta were strictly second level destinations for commercial types because real business ran through Singapore and Hong Kong and if you were doing a corporate acquisition in uh, Vietnam that would probably be run out of Singapore it, it, it wouldn't be run out of Bangkok and I think the result of that was that you didn't get a lot of highly skilled commercial people here in the 90s mostly because there wasn't anything to do there, there wasn't something here that drew people the people who were drawn to Thailand were a totally different type and, and the undemanding nature of life here has, has always caused a sort of wash up of people on the great dirty beach of Bangkok. And they were people who were generally socially maladroit, uh, unsuccessful, uh, uh, people who were overmatched because out there in the real world life can be tough. I mean it bangs on you. There's a battle going on all the time. And, and you came to Thailand and there was no battle. It was Bai Pin Lai. I mean, that was the national slogan. Who cares? And, and, and so we drew those people. I think that's beginning to change because Thailand has become financially far more sophisticated in the last 20 years. And so there are commercial things to do here now that bring in much more sophisticated uh, class of expats. Um, still not a lot of entrepreneurship here. This isn't Singapore. It isn't Hong Kong. 
but in terms of employment of people who are better educated, more experienced, more sophisticated, I, I think that that's clearly so. And as, as Thailand continues to increase in sophistication, I think that will change, although given the, the political circumstances here now, it may take a while. I mean, there may be another generation. But the guys who washed up here are beginning to sort of sink out of sight. And that's become a less important part of the city. But gosh, when I first came here, it was it was truly amazing. I mean, you, you found old, old characters here that you thought had disappeared a generation ago. The toothless old America pilots sitting in bars telling war stories about Vietnam. It was just, it was a movie. I mean, that was, I ended up writing this movie script here. The place was a movie. And, and we've gained something, but we've lost something. Mm -hmm. and, and I have to admit to you, there are times I kind of miss it the way it was. I can imagine. So obviously, before you came here, you used to be a lawyer back in America. How do you think the um, US legal system compares or contrasts to the Thai legal system? It was uh, John Adams who said that America is a government uh, of laws, not of men. And uh, Thailand is precisely the opposite. It is a government of nothing but men, and, and very few laws that anybody cares anything about. Uh, the nature of Western society is we believe in institutions. We believe in the Constitution. We believe in the Magna Carta. We believe in Parliament. We believe in a system of laws, which are uh, applied more or less equally to all people. When they're not applied equally, it's not because we don't want to, it's because in some small instance that doesn't occur. And so we do our best to make sure that we don't make that mistake again, and the laws are applied equally next time. As a lawyer in the West, you can advise clients on the probability of the consequences of certain acts by looking at hundreds of years of, of precedent, by looking at the, at the basis of law, because you know it will be applied, it will be applied equally. Thailand don't know anything of the sort. People make up laws as they go along. They change the regulations. You get a new guy in office and he changes everything. Um, in, in the early days of the, of the demonstrations here, the, a guy sent me a picture, which he knew I would love, of a bunch of Thais waving signs. And the fellow in the front was waving one which said in, in Thai and English, uh, in the rule of law. Now, I have no idea what that means, but it's a very scary concept that if, if you don't like the laws, well, you just ignore them, you end them, you, you decide, oh, we're just going to appoint some people because we don't want the laws. I don't know how a lawyer functions in that kind of an environment, I really don't. Because our only function as guides to our clients is, is to describe for them the, the context of law, the context of, of in which they are operating, the context in which they're going to make decisions, and make them aware of the consequences of the decisions that they're going to make. One of the great comforts of practicing law is we don't make the decisions. We get to go home. Um, you know, I, I, when I first started practicing, I was a public defender in the District of Columbia, and our, our standard speech was standing there talking to the guy in the cell and saying, look, you don't have to tell me the truth. Please understand this. I'm going to go home tonight, and I'm going to have a shower and a nice dinner, and you're not. So maybe you ought to think about telling me the truth. The truth doesn't have much meaning here. And, and law doesn't have much meaning. And, and I just don't know how you, you think about the future of a society for which law does not have meaning. Because then all acts ultimately become random. And in Thailand, it's largely management by whim, whether you're talking about governments or commercial enterprises. They're not managed in the way that we manage enterprises in the West. They're managed by whim which was why I started out with the Jack Shepard character arriving here by whim, because he thought that was pretty cool. And, and he's been here a while when he begins to discover that whims aren't really all that great, that we live our lives, we run our societies based on restraints, based on, on law, based on understandings of, of what we can do and what we can't do and what consequences that has for other people. Thailand doesn't work that way. It's, it's management by whim, it's life by whim. And, and that sounds pretty cool until you actually have to live it. So what's next for you then? Have you got plenty of more material in you for more books? Yeah, I suppose I'll keep doing what I'm doing. The next book that's scheduled is uh, the third of the Inspector Samuel Tay books. This one's called The Dead American, and it's uh, uh, it grew out of some events in Singapore recently in which uh, a young American engineer 
uh, who had quit a job that involves some very high level research which may or may not have involved a Chinese company was found hung in his apartment and it was very quickly declared to be a suicide by his parents were far less certain that it was a suicide and there were a lot of very suspicious circumstances surrounding it. Um, sounded to me like a good basis for a book and uh, and Sam Tay uh, had gotten in a little trouble with the Singapore Police Department in the last book, which was called The Umbrella Man. So Sam didn't have much to do, and I thought maybe I'd trot him out and get him to investigate this. And that's, uh, that's the Sam Tay book that's in preparation now. Sounds good. Thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure.